As you grow in this whiskey hobby, you're going to learn things. Mm -hmm. Would you like to know what the old timers said that they wish they would have known when they first got started? Because if you do, stick around. So, we have Bourbon Real Talk community. Yeah. We crowdsource information for this podcast there. Mm -hmm. And I asked the question of the whiskey old timers. What are some things that you've learned along the way that you wish you would have known when you first got started in the hobby? Yeah, absolutely. And boy, did they deliver. There's lots of things. I'm not even a, a whiskey old timer, and I've got things I wish I knew right. a few years ago. Right. They gave so much information that when I got done writing it, I realized this has got to be a two-parter. Yeah. Okay, so you're watching part one. Yeah. And stay tuned next week for part two to get all 12 of the recommendations, mm -hmm. but we're gonna get through as much as we can this week. We want it to be consumable for you. Sure. So definitely subscribe, ring that bell so that you get the reminder next week when the next episode comes out. For sure. All right, so first off, as usual, we have to start off with the disclaimers. Of course. And uh, we this is all crowdsourced. Mm -hmm. So if there's some lesson that you've learned that uh, you're like, why didn't they say this? Well, the community didn't mention it. Right. And we added some of our own stuff in there as well, too. Sure, so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but let's just jump right in let's do uh, it. with the lessons. Yeah, there's lots of them. So the, the first, and we basically broke it up into categories. Yeah. And then we're gonna talk about some of the more specific things they said. So the, the first thing, the first category is how you drink your whiskey affects your experience. Absolutely. Whether or not it's a positive or a negative experience, it's affected by how you drink it. Yeah. And A number one, no shots. No. Yeah, please. Please. In fact, never ever do shots. There is never a time that you should ever consume that amount of alcohol and that amount of time. And the it's, next morning you regret them. I you'll promise. regret, yeah. Um, and the next recommendation was to warm up your palate. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. And that's one of my regrets as well is you just jump right into the good stuff right off the bat. And one thing that I've learned is obviously after you drink for, you know, a couple ounces, your palate starts to kind of warm up and develop, and mm -hmm. then you really start tasting some things that weren't there before. So, right. great. So, so go slow, right? Mm -hmm. I want you to nose the glass, right? Really get in there and smell it. Um, it does help with the burn of your nostrils if you part your lips a little bit. Yep. When you're, when you're breathing in. Um, and start off with very small sips, and use your tongue to push it around your, coat your entire palate and your body will naturally yeah. proof it down because you'll start to salivate. And that's how you can kind of ease your way into it without like just boom, all of a sudden you've got, you know, all of this heat on your palate. Right. And so that's what we mean when we say, you know, warm it up. Yeah. And uh, the next thing is your palate takes time to develop. Yeah. Right. And so what some people get discouraged, they start watching reviews and they're like, I don't taste marzipan. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Right? You might later. You might not ever. Right. There's only one thing that matters. When you put the whiskey in your mouth, does it taste good or right. does it not taste yeah. good? Right? And and on that note, I mean, understand that there is some value to listening to those videos and those those reviews. But at the end of the day, everyone's palate's different. Mm -hmm. And so just because someone gets butterscotch on a tasting note, and so you love butterscotch, so you run out and buy that bottle as quick as you can. If you get home and crack it open and don't taste butterscotch, especially on the first pour, uh, don't be discouraged because there's a good chance that your palate isn't theirs. Yeah. And so That's don't, totally don't okay. use that as an opportunity to get discouraged about a bottle and a particular palate taste. Yeah. Another recommendation to make the drinking experience special is to do a little bit of research before you, you get into that bottle. For sure. Um, so it, it it's a weird phenomenon, but somehow whiskey tastes better at the distillery. Why? Because you're you're sitting there and you're having that experience yep. with people that are passionate about making it. Yep. You're hearing the backstory and you can kind of hack your brain in the same way by doing a little bit of research. And it also helps foster relationships because if you know something about a brand, you can talk with people about yeah. it. Most of the time, I, I think the whiskey tastes better at a distillery because it was free. But, <laughs> uh, but that is some truth to that as well. And I know from personal experience that some of these distillers I've been to, especially if it's a small craft distillery, you really get to know the people there. You see their process. It's unique. And it does just give that, that, that whiskey a little bit better flavor. Yeah. 
And along the lines of how you drink, we recommend, and the community recommended, that you have a handful of bottles on hand, Mm -hmm. uh, all of them be open, and whenever you do drink, you don't just drink that one from that one bottle all night long. Take smaller pours and switch between different producers, and that's going to help you to start to notice some of the nuance of flavor differences between different brands. Yeah, for sure. If you're the type of person that has two glasses, two pours a night, well, split those two into four and try four different distillery brands and uh, really help to spread out your experience and see if you can start picking up on those little nuances. A whiskey troll is a person who seeks negative attention and uses contrarian attitudes to derail civil discussion in online forums. They communicate in ways they never would face to face because they're keyboard warriors. Their only goal is to make other people feel inferior. Hey guys, I'm new here. I just got my first Blanton's. And trust me, you probably paid way too much. I don't care much about the Blanton's, but nice (laughs) There's no way that she didn't buy that at secondary. Idiot. Oh, I know how you got that bottle. So, are you sick and tired of the whiskey trolls running your fun online? Well, that's why we started Bourbon Real Talk Community. Congratulations. Let me know what you think when you open it up. Hey, welcome to the group. Let me send you over a sample of Blanton's Gold and straight from the barrel. See how you like those. I remember back to my first bottle of Blanton's. It was the birthday to my son, and we enjoy it every year on his birthday. Congrats. So if you're looking to connect with some people online who aren't head over to facebook.com and join Bourbon Real Talk community today. Another tip was a drop of water or a piece of ice will completely change the flavor. Right. Yeah, that could be good or bad for some people. Right, right. But if you're trying something and it's a little bit hot, you know, you want to throw a drop of water in it. I've had those experiences before with mm-hmm. cash strength whiskey. Uh, it can really make the difference. Yep. So don't be afraid to high, to add it to, especially the high proof stuff. But also, if you're just getting into your whiskey journey, um, even a hundred proof whiskey may be a little bit too much for you to go from drinking mixed drinks to straight neat bourbon. So don't be afraid to don't be afraid to drop a little water in there and don't feel bad about it. Yeah, but go slow. Yeah. Um, I've seen too many times at distilleries we're trying something. It's going to be bottled at a lower proof, and somebody goes, "Oh, we should proof it down and see what it's going to be like." And they grab their bottle of water and glug glug glug, and yeah. they're like, "No, you took it from 120 to like 20 proof." Yeah, this is 12 proof. Now. Yeah, Enjoy. go 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 slow with with adding the water and the ice, and and see if you can find that sweet spot. So, and I also recommend that when you're tasting, um, that some of the time you have a bourbon flavor will available. Sure. Uh, Because it'll help your your mind be able to focus on, am I experiencing these flavors? Yeah. I mean, I I used to, and I still do, I've got a little note section in my phone that if I'm trying a whiskey for the first time, I'll make a quick note on it, you know, as I'm tasting it, just so I can refer back to it. If someone said, have you ever had this? I can give them accurate information, at least from my experience. So. All right. So that was recommendation number one. What do we have for number two? So yeah, moving right along to number two, it is is the recommendation to be adventurous. A lot of these guys said, man, I wish I would a little bit been a little bit more adventurous in my early days. You mm-hmm. know, I, I found what I liked and I stuck with it and I've just rode that train all the way to the depot. But listen, there's no problem with kind of branching out and trying some new things every once in a while. For sure. And you got to taste things with intention to even know whether or not it's something that you like. Right. That's going to help you develop your palate. So pay attention whenever you're tasting things, not just whiskey yeah. either. Like even when you're eating your food and things like that, you can start to develop those those neural pathways that you can recall later to help you to tell what it is that you're actually tasting. And that's part of being of interest is trying new things. Yeah. And, and part of one of the greatest things about being in a bourbon community, which we absolutely recommend that you are a part of one, if not only online bourbon real talk community. But when you have those great bottles that you come across and you're not quite ready to branch out yet, and when you are ready to take that step, reach out to some of those experienced drinkers and say, hey, here's a bottle I really like. Mm-hmm. What are some other options that are in kind of in that similar vein, maybe that similar mash bill that I might like as well, and they can help point you in a direction to try some new things, at least in a more intentional way. Sure. And I know that this is bourbon real talk, but I think you do need to branch out a little bit. Try some scotch, sure. try some Indian single malts, Japanese, Irish, Canadian, just get out there and try things and see what you like. You might, you may find that there are other types of spirits that you love. Right. And hopefully flavored whiskeys isn't one of them. And you said it earlier about being at a distillery. Uh, try local. 
Yeah. Um, if you if there is a distillery nearby, you should definitely get out there and try and experience it and, and go do the tour. I mean, it really does make the drinking experience better when you've got that background information. Yeah, for sure. And it shows that you're in it for the right reasons. When you start building some of these relationships with the smaller stores, whenever they have their own drops and with distilleries that might be in your area, it really kind of just sets you up as, hey, I'm in it for the whiskey community and not just for the whiskey. And that brings us to recommendation number three, mm. which is to pick a store or a small number of stores. Yeah. Yeah and build a relationship. Yeah, I mean, so so many times in the early days of someone's whiskey journey, they're just trying to find a bottle, right? And they don't care where they buy that bottle from. They're, 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 just, they're just on this hunt for this one bottle that they heard something about. And the detrimental side of that is that you'd never get to build that relationship and probably get access to that bottle a lot quicker than you would have in the first place. Right, right. So when you go in, talk, have pleasant conversations, Yep. Bring samples of other things that you have to offer if you know that they're a drinker. Offer to open the bottle so sure. that they can try it. That way they know you're not going to sell it. Be kind. Support their picks. If they yep. do single barrels, you should buy some of their single barrel products. Um, and it's not a bad idea to learn their delivery schedules and what time they stock mm -hmm. if they're a first come first serve store because some stores are. Yep. And that could be a very crucial piece of information. Um, and then when they ask, uh, can I help? Let them help. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are some very knowledgeable people that work at some local liquor stores right. and they might turn you on to something that, uh, that you haven't heard of before that you really, really love. Yeah. And one thing I would add to this is to most, most of the time, some of you drink bourbon, but there's also other things that you drink or your spouse drinks, right? So don't be afraid to throw all of that, that, buying power toward one relationship right mm -hmm. if you're going to buy beer to stock your beer fridge or some wine or vodka or whatever uh, spend it all at the one store that you're trying to build that relationship from don't buy it at walmart or the grocery store and then only buy your bourbon from one store it shows them that you're there for the long haul yeah and we have i think three full-length episodes on how to build relationships sure. with liquor stores yeah so you can go watch those but that's kind of the abridged version yeah um so our next uh category recommendation was what to expect from a bourbon. Yeah. Okay. So Meaning that they wish they knew. They what wish they, they knew what to right. expect. That they could just read the level and go, okay, I think this is going to be like that. Right? Sure. Yeah. And so some very simple things that you can kind of put in your repertoire would be mash bill. Right. right. Getting a good grasp on what some of those ingredients mean. Like corn usually means there's going to be a sweetness to it, right? The rye is that kind of punchy, spicy, baking spice type notes that you would get. The wheat is, again, more on the softer side, a little bit more uh, easy to drink for some people. Usually has a little bit of a fruity and citrusy taste with it as well. So right. keep that in mind when you're thinking mash bill. Yeah. And then age, right? Because a lot of bourbons have an age statement on them. Generally speaking, if it's under six years old and it's from Kentucky, it might be a little bit grainy. It might have some sharper mm -hmm. uh, flavors, if you will. Like, it, you know, when you're tasting it, there's something that kind of sticks out and it's sure. kind of, it, it feels sharp. Um, but then you get to the six to 12 year bourbons. Those are typically more balanced and integrated and, and you don't have those sharp flavors. Yeah. I, I refer to those as like a round mouthfeel, which right. sounds strange. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and then over 12, it's like suspect, right? right. Because you never know. sometimes they're just over oaked and they're bitter and tannic and they're off balance and they've lost all their fruit. Uh, and sometimes they're still delicious. So, right. um, but you know, knowing what to expect can help you to make some good purchasing decisions and also know with regard to age, it, it, things age very differently in Kentucky than they do in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And so where 18 years would be kind of on the low end of the premium range for scotch, uh, that would be on the super high end of the premium age sure. range for bourbon. Yeah. The number five recommendation was this word or this phrase that we've all heard in the whiskey community, and it is FOMO. FOMO is real. Of missing out. Fear of missing out. Now, that is probably my number one in my <laughs> list. It's like, man, I wish I would have known that so much earlier on because there is this... Uh, this hype that's around so many brands that we all hear and we know and that fear of missing out you get that dopamine release and you just really want to get after it for your collector gene to be fulfilled mm -hmm. and uh so you don't you kind of throw budget aside you throw everything that cares to the wind you're willing to drive as far and do as work as hard as you can to get that one bottle and so i think what a lot of people who have experienced in the whiskey community would say is that 
yeah, every once in a while, it's worth seeking out that bottle. But for the most part, you pass up so many good ones on the way there that you wish you would have just settled for some stuff that you saw on the shelf and been patient and get that bottle at the right time. Yeah, and that was one of the biggest recommendations was to yeah. work inside of a budget. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people that got into <clears throat> the game, got excited, went nuts, spent a bunch of money, pissed their spouse off, <laughs> right? And and a lot of people kind of regret that now. Right, yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, they were saying, look, don't overpay. Right. Have the patience to, to build the relationships, you buy the bottom shelfers, all that stuff. And then when you do get that bottle, it'll be that much more rewarding. Right? Yeah, and, and also you've got to know that there are other versions of elevated experiences outside of just hunting down a pappy, right? right? There are store picks and single barrels that give you that extra oomph and that kind of rarity and it makes you feel like you really got a good bottle that's not available to everyone and still make you feel like you got a good pick it's also going to be at that high proof that really good uh typically a barrel strength and it's uh it's it's a win it's, it's a really win. a win yeah and that actually brings us to the next the next point number six is because you don't want to blindly follow the whiskey tube or XYZ podcast out there and chase whatever they say is good because right. your palate is different. Yeah. Right. So again, save these experiences for something that you have already tried multiple times in your journey and you know you really like it, then go chase the bottle. This was one of my favorite ones because I'm, I'm arguing against myself. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, but it's true. Uh, right. if, if you pay much attention out there, you know, you don't know. They could be in. They may be influenced in saying what they're saying because of views, mm -hmm. or you know that you get more uh, views giving a negative view of something that's popular than, sure. than vice versa. There might be sponsorship uh, issues at play. There could be politics at play, right? Right. Um, and so you can't always trust exactly what they're saying. Plus, your palate might be different. But a, a lot of people said if you're going to pay attention to reviews, and and there is a place for reviews. They can sure. be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. You need to watch some reviews of the reviewer where they're tasting things that you're familiar with mm -hmm. and see whether or not you agree with them when you know what it is that they're tasting. And it makes it that more likely that you will agree with them when they give you a recommendation for something you haven't had before. Right. And it also helps you to understand if their palates are similar to yours as well. If they're picking up on some notes that you've, you've, you've picked up on separately in trying that, that's a good sign. And because sometimes, to be honest, the tasting notes are for show, right? Right. Somebody said, "I've been looking at the reviews for such and such, and they're all oh, it was the uh, the the uh, Knob Creek 18." Okay. And they're like, people are saying so much different stuff. I don't know what to believe. And I just commented, "We're all full of <laughs> drink what you like." <laughs> yeah, drink what you like. Right. Everyone's palate's different. Right. The, the, and Randy's coin phrase is, "The palate wants what the palate wants." That's and right. That's just what it is. So that is one through six. That's all the time that we have for yeah. this week's episode. Be sure to tune in next week to hear 7 through 12. Equally as good information in that as well. If this is your first time tuning in, I want to thank you for watching and also tell you a little bit about the show philosophy. Yeah. We are all about bringing people together around bourbon. And that's something that's personally important to me because I lost a loved one to suicide in 2014. And in the aftermath of that, I was looking for a way to make a difference in other people's lives so that they wouldn't feel the lack of community that my brother felt when he made that decision. And I started noticing how bourbon had a power to bring people together, even people who would normally not have had a connection in life. And I thought if whiskey's that powerful, maybe I could get people connected to whiskey and the whiskey will do the rest of the job and mm -hmm. get people connected to each other. So that's part of the reason why we started the show. Along the journey though, we did see kind of the negative underbelly of the enthusiast community online, and that's trolls. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of people being hateful to strangers online. And that led me to two conclusions. One, Wes was right that we needed to um, have a community, Bourbon Real Talk community, that is troll free. Yep. Um, but, but it also made me realize that if those people can hate you online, there's nothing that keeps me from loving you online. And that's why we end every podcast the same way, and that's this. If you woke up this morning, and you're unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that we, we love, love you. you. We'll see you next time on Bourbon Roll Talk. Cheers. I know. So let's wrap it up. Let's wrap up this episode and encourage them to stay tuned for next week and watch the. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, wrap this episode up. All right. The palette wants what the palette wants. 
That's where you come in and start talking. Oh, because I have to do the f***ing outro. Yeah, you're doing an outro. All right, you ready? The palette oh. wants what the palette wants. Hold on, you gotta put that. You gotta put that in outtakes. Yeah. Because I mean, I had the blankest look on my face. <laughs> you're like, I've ever. I was like, I don't. What's he doing? Keep going. What the f- are you doing? What are you doing? God, that was great. Sound well, music.